not lacking, amen? All right, you may have heard, you may have heard the expression, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Ever heard that before? Every once in a while it's even true. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life. I can't make it. Only you can make it. But the topic of Bible prophecy changes people. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen over and over again. I've seen it happen to several people in this room right now. So remember that. Whatever you leave here today with, and that's between you and God, but whatever you leave here today with, today can be the first day of the rest of your life. And my hope tonight is to challenge you, no matter what your background is, no matter what your religious, social, or ethnic, or financial background is, whatever brought you here tonight, my hope is that you leave here feeling challenged. And I hope that by God's grace, you will decide to live up to that challenge. So, okay. Growing up, my father was a very big fan of Superman. He was a fan of everything Superman related, the TV shows. How many of you remember there was a TV show? <sighs> Young people. Uh, the TV shows, the movies, starring Christopher Reeve, who's no longer with us, and the comic books. Every medium in which Superman showed up, my father was a fan, and I became a fan as I grew up and during my comic book years. Uh, which was quite a long time. I started buying them in the fifth grade and quit when I graduated college when I suddenly realized there were more important things to spend money on. But see, the thing is, the original Superman movie from the 1970s opens on the planet Krypton from which Superman comes. And Superman's father, his name is jor -El. He is a uh, man with authority on Krypton, and he, we meet him as he is pleading with the leaders of the planet Krypton to listen to what he has to say. He says, our planet is doomed. It is on a collision course with eternity, and if we do not do something about it, we will all perish. The leadership of the planet listen to him, but his warnings go unheeded. They laugh him off. They say, everything is the same as it has always been. We're in no danger. You are a fanatic. And so he leaves. But convinced that his own words are true, he goes back to his home and his family, and he places his infant son, Kal-El, into a rocket ship and sends him to Earth, where he hopes that the baby will grow up safely. And in the movie, very shortly, almost immediately after liftoff, planet Krypton explodes. And life on Krypton ends. The only remaining survivor is Kal-El, who grows up as Clark Kent and eventually Superman, when he realizes that his powers must be used for good. In 1997, I was working at a business called Baxter's Pharmacy in Haverstorm, New York. While I was working there, I was, uh, Christine told you I have a background in movies, and even though I hadn't been in college yet, I was excited about movies in general, and there was a big movie, like the biggest movie of all time, that was supposed to come out at the end of the summer, toward the end of summer 1997. It had a lot of buzz. The production had been delayed and had gone over budget and not by a small amount. It was clay, claimed to have the best special effects that you had ever seen in your life. And just the buzz about this movie was just incredible. Like, people were lining up to see it. And when it finally did come out, you might remember a little movie called Titanic. When it finally did come out, it debuted to overwhelming commercial success. It was so successful that in February of 98, the following winter when I began to work at a movie theater, it was still playing to commercial success. And there was a woman who came into my theater faithfully every single week to watch this movie, and had done so since it had debuted. Dropping four, remember how long this movie is? Four hours at a time of her life, and eight to ten dollars, right? To, to watch this movie over and over again. Now, I was pretending like I was some kind of film major or film, you know, 
whatever. And so I used to get these film industry trade publications. And as crazy as I believe this woman was, I read a story in these trade magazines of a different woman who went to see it not every week, but every day since it had debuted six months earlier. Superman spawned three sequels before Christopher Reeve you know, died. <laughs> Uh, and ultimately a remake a few years ago. Titanic was the biggest movie ever. It, it had the top box office grossing record until a year or two ago when it was beaten by another movie by the same director. You might remember another little movie, Avatar. It finally broke the Titanic record. But what was it about these two things that made them so popular and so successful? What do they have in common? Well, Jor-El stood before his peers and said, please listen to me. Something is changing, something is happening, and we need to take action. And his words went unheeded. And of course, Titanic, based on a true story, has the same idea, right? This is the story of human arrogance at its finest. We built a great big thing, we decided it cannot be sunk, and so we just, we wander off into the icy depths uh, oblivious to the dangers that might be out there because we believe we've overcome them. And the true story of the Titanic is that during its voyage, the captain and the crew received five different warnings from five different sources saying, there's ice, slow down, be careful. And every single one of those warnings went unheeded. Until finally the fateful night when it ran almost head first, they veered a little bit, but side first into an iceberg, tore a 300 foot hole in the hull, and a few hours later, the ship was at the bottom of the ocean. Everyone on board Titanic died, except for the 700 people who fit into the insufficient lifeboats. This is called dramatic irony, by the way, if you've studied this kind of thing. It's when the audience knows something about the story that the characters inside the story do not. Uh, it breaks the fourth wall. It makes us feel a sort of tension because we know what's going to happen. We know that the characters can do something about it if only they weren't so short-sighted. But as we watch them run headfirst into their destinies, all we can do is marvel at how blind they were. I believe life imitates art. I'm an artist by training. I've seen this. And I believe that life imitates art. So people today are scared. Have you noticed? You watch the news? Do you watch even The Daily Show? I'm talking to college crew here, right? Or do you watch anything like that to get a feel for what is going on out there in the world today? Do you realize people are scared? People are scared about the seemingly endless wars going on. People are scared about the, the finances that have been lagging for three years now with no end in sight. People are scared about a government that doesn't work. People are scared about the environment. People are scared about everything. As we learn data about our dwindling resources and our government upheavals and our splintered politics, our bankrupt economic system all around the world, we realize, thinking men and women realize that things cannot go on the way that they always have. It is mathematically impossible. We will reach a point where things must change dramatically because that's just math. And we're scared about what's going to happen after that change or during that change. Humankind isn't so good at changing. Every day, people are living in fear of what's coming next. In August of 2001, I used to be able to walk all the way inside an airport past security to the gate to either see a loved one off on their flight or meet an incoming loved one as they stepped off the plane. In September of 2001, that was no longer the case. And as a result of this horrible tragedy, which by the way was no picnic to live through, from someone who lived through it, this changed everything. And in September of 2001, we suddenly find people voluntarily surrendering their liberties in order to feel safe. And I have not met anyone at the gate in 10 years. So now, instead of walking through on scathe, now we have to like take off our clothes and get x-rayed and um, unpack everything we brought to be scanned separately. So you got to send your belt and your shoes and your wallet and your phone and your computer and your liquids and everything through separately. So it used to take two minutes and now it takes 10. And then 
you've got to sit in the little chair when you're done for 10 more minutes putting all your stuff back together while everyone is queuing up behind you for your chair. That's not a fun experience. Well, if you ever want a passing thrill, you tell them you don't want to go through the backscatter machine and they will touch every part of your body to make sure you're not a terrorist. <laughs> Everyday people are scared. Thinking men and women, smart women, sense there's something big on the horizon. That in fact, humanity is on a collision course with eternity. But we don't know what it is. And no one really admits anything. You try telling someone out there that things have to change, and you will get called a fanatic. You will get called all sorts of names. Don't you know things don't really change? Everything's the same as it's always been. You're being alarmist. Everything will be fine. As a child of six, I remember driving past a newspaper recycling plant in the town of Suffern, New York, where I lived. And even at six years old, even before recycling became part of the everyday vernacular, I realized something. I asked my father, what is this plant? What do they do there? What's its purpose? And he explained the concept of recycling paper to me. And I did the math at six. And I said, well, that seems important. Because if we don't reuse what we have, aren't we going to run out at some point? And my father said, no, no. We will have infinite resources to keep making everything we ever need and infinite space on the earth to put all of our waste. And he meant it. He really did. But I never believed it. I realized the earth is a finite organism. It can only produce so much. It can only hold so much. And I, this began a life of worry for me. As I said, thank you for finding my anxiety funny. I appreciate that. Um, I realized, with everything I heard about the, the rainforest being cut down, or um, other forests being cut down, or peak oil, right? There's just a constant flow of oil everywhere, or heaven forbid an oil spill. All of these things made me so nervous, because I said, well, we can't just do this forever. It's going to run out at some point. This manifested itself as anxiety and depression in my life. And I was medicated for many years through high school and college. So this is not a small matter. I mean, this is something I took very seriously for a long time. But despite having just about cried the first time I heard of a Hummer getting 12 miles a gallon, <laughs> I eventually learned something that changed my perspective on this whole thing. And some of what I learned is what I brought here tonight to share with you. So what was this magic mystery thing that changed my perspective? Well, the idea is Bible prophecy. The world today is scared. They're searching. They're almost screaming for answers. Doesn't anybody know anything anymore? Heaven forbid you used to have faith in the government. They have done a pretty good job over the last couple of years of making sure that you realize that they're a bunch of idiots too, just like everybody else. So no one knows anything, but everybody's looking for something, but they're not looking in the right places. And so we find people looking uh, to the experts, and the stock market, and the gold market, and the bond market, and the psychics, and the historians, and the politicians, and the astrologers, all in an attempt to find something with meaning. But there are very few people looking where you actually find answers you can count on. Some of you may not be Christians. I know, I've just met most of you. Some of you may not self-identify as Christian. You may not know very much about the Bible. You might be skeptical about God. That's okay. Some of you may already consider yourselves Christian, but not know as much about the Bible as maybe you think you should. That is also okay. Especially if you came here skeptical about prophecy. A lot of churches don't study prophecy. What are we going to learn tonight? I obviously cannot squish everything I know about Bible prophecy into an hour or so. So we only can look at a little bit. But I want to calm your fears. If you suffer in the same way that I used to, I want to calm you down. I want to introduce you to something you may not have heard before. And so let's start with some basics, shall we? If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, please turn to Isaiah chapter 48. Verse, and we're going to read verses 3 through 5. Now, I am reading from the New King James Version. If you have a different version, that's okay. 
Um, not all Bibles are created equal, but for the purposes of what we're going to do tonight, it really doesn't matter what translation you brought with you. So open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, I suggest marking your table of contents because we're going to jump around the Bible tonight. Okay? So mark your table of contents in Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 through 5. We read the following. This is God speaking. He says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to hear. Suddenly I did them, and, it, and they came to pass. Because I knew that you were obstinate, and your neck was in an iron sinew, and your brow bronze, even from the beginning I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, My idol has done them, and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. God says in this passage that he declares things before they come to pass. And he does so as evidence that he is real. As evidence, in fact, that he is in control of the events that he prophesies. That, in fact, the very events of history, both past, present, and future, are all in the hand of God. I happen to believe this. I believe that Bible prophecy is the surest way to prove the existence of God. Have you met Christians and you ask them why they believe in God, but you get unsatisfactory answers? You get answers like, well, God calls us to a life of faith. Or something like, well, you know, there's, there's no way to really know for sure. That's what faith is all about. Or like, or this one, right? This common one. You know, I'd rather believe in God and then turn out to be wrong than not believe in God and then turn out to be wrong, right? You ever hear that? Or the worst possible one? Well, if you don't believe, then you go to hell. Why don't you meet Christians who answer you by saying, I believe in God because I know Bible prophecy? Why don't you meet those people? You may wonder why so many professed Christians are ignorant of Bible prophecy if my claim is true that Bible prophecy can indeed prove the existence of God. And that is an excellent thing to wonder, but we're going to come back to it. Right? I will address that, but not quite yet. For right now, you may also be wondering, so what? Regarding Isaiah chapter 48. So what? The book can say anything. Some monk in a cave wrote this down a million years ago, but it's not God, it's not real. How do you know? Why do you have any real faith? Well, let us look at one of the claims that the Bible makes about itself. We've got to start somewhere, right? So turn in your Bibles to the New Testament book of 2 Peter. It is a small book back toward the end of the New Testament near the book of Revelation. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we will read verses 19 through 20. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and verses 19 through 20. 21, I think. Yeah, 21. Um, even though I am trying to have the scriptures up here for you, I encourage you to read it out of your own Bible. It's just for some reason that probably only God really understands it is much better that way to read it out of the Bible than off of the screen. The Bible says in this passage, 2 Peter, chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as the light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You see that the Bible makes the claim that everything written in the Bible comes directly from God. It says that the Holy Spirit of God revealed messages to the prophets who then wrote the messages down in their own words. And these series of writings were collected over a period of like 1,800 years into what we know today as the Bible. Why is this important? Well, prophecy, first of all, does mean future telling. But in the context of how Peter is using it, it also means any communication from God to man, whether it is future telling or not. And so, by extension, we understand from Peter that every single thing that you read, it claims to be directly from God. And so that's significant because if you choose to believe that, you can trust 
everything that you read as truth. And God makes promises. Did you know that? God makes hundreds of promises to us in the Bible, and He means everything He says. It's all true. But the flip side of that is that if you choose to disbelieve some of it, you have to disbelieve all of it. Because the claim is universal. It says, they're all equal. They all come from the same place. There's not some passages that are more inspired by God than others. Do you get it? We see this echoed somewhere else in Scripture. Let's turn to the book of 2 Timothy, also in the New Testament, shortly before Peter. Here's a little shortcut. All of the Bible books that start with the letter T are all in the same place, and they're all in alphabetical order. So if you find yourself in the books of Thessalonians or Titus, you are close. Right? 2 Timothy is where we are going, to chapter 3 and verse 16. Oop, did you lose me? You lost me. I didn't do anything. All right, he's going to work on that while we continue. So 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy is written by the Apostle Paul to, of course, Timothy. That's why it's called what it's called. And he tells us in this passage, chapter 3, verse 15, uh, 16, that all Scripture, how much is all? All. All is all, right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Yep. Still on. You get it? Alright, so we've seen it twice now. Two different Bible authors make the same claim about the origin of the scriptures, and we need to remember this because most churches today, I'm not making this up, you tell me if I'm wrong, most churches today ignore or discard entire portions of the Bible for one reason or another. But the Bible makes the claim that all of it is from God. And did you know there's 66 books in the Bible? Why do our churches focus on like six of them? If we accept the challenge that the Bible puts before us, the challenge is, here is a message from heaven. You do well to read it, right? If we accept that message, then... We have to accept the existence of God. And if we accept the existence of God, then we must reckon with the claims that he makes about us and the responsibilities that he gives to us. We have to recognize that God is something bigger than ourselves. Um, and it's something outside of us. It's something we cannot change, even if we wanted to. Many people don't make that choice. Hey, good job, brother. All right. Your hand for the AP guy. this thing back. Hold on. Alright. Many people do not make the choice to believe in God. And although you'll probably hear a bunch of different answers, I believe there's only one real answer people don't make that choice, and it's because they would rather live their lives their own way. We are in need of the next slide. Okay. They are not interested in hearing God's instructions about salvation or about righteousness or about obedience or about what is right and what is wrong. It is much more interesting to the human heart to decide for oneself what is right and what is wrong. So to ignore the instructions from the Bible, we have to deny God's existence. Because if you're ignoring the words of God, remember the Bible claims it's from God. So we have to reject God if we reject the messages in the Bible. You can't have it both ways. You can't say God is real, but the Bible is false. Conversely, you can't say the Bible is real, but God is not. It's a, it's a package deal, right? You have to accept it all. If you are still sitting here and haven't walked out, then you are at least entertaining the idea that God is real. Good for you. Whether you are convinced or not, I don't know. But good for you for giving it a fighting chance. I want to make another, I want to look at another claim the Bible makes. And we find it in the book of Ephesians. 
chapter 4 and verse 5. Ephesians is a little itty bitty book about midway through the New Testament in between the books of Galatians and Philippians. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. The Bible says in this verse that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Did you catch that? There is one faith. How are there more than 400 different kinds of Christian churches if there is but one faith? There's only one Bible, a few different English translations of the Bible, but the source material is all the same. There's only one. How did we get to this place in Christianity today where nobody can agree on anything and everyone claims to have the truth? It is no wonder that so many non-Christians have a hard time coming to God. Our churches make it next to impossible to do so. If I say one thing to you, and then you go back to your church or a different church, and then your pastor says something that is totally the opposite of what I say, how are you supposed to know what is true? Maybe none of it is true. Maybe we're all just making stuff up. Maybe this whole Bible thing, this whole God thing is a bunch of nonsense. You see the problem there? Is there a way to study the Bible with confidence? Is there a way to approach Bible study so that we can come away with conclusions that we can feel good about and that we know are true? Where should we look for answers about God and the Bible? Not everywhere is not the answer I'm looking for. Where should we go for an authoritative truth, source of truth, on God and the Bible? Yeah, God. God is correct, and how does He communicate with us? We should go to the Word of God for answers about the Word of God. Amen? I think the reason we have so many problems in Christianity is because we go to, you know, this book or that book or this history or this movie or whatever, and we don't go to the Bible. So let's go to the Bible. Amen? Let's go to the book of Isaiah. We were already there once today. We opened there, but we're going to chapter 28. Isaiah 28, verses 9 and 10. We're going to see God's prescription on the right way to study the Bible. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Now we're going to see the word he there, and that means God. Starting in verse 9, the Bible says, Whom will he, God, teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Is it those just weaned from milk? Is it those just drawn from the breasts? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. If there is only one God, and if he chose to reveal himself in the Bible, through the Bible, it stands to reason, then, that he would not write down contradictory things. Amen? I got, where's the amen? I mean, that's just logic, right? If there is one God, and if he chose to do it in this way, then it stands to reason he would not write down stuff that contradicts itself. So, a mature way to study the Bible is to find a point of truth, and then to look at all of the other places in the Bible that talk about the similar thing. And if these other places do not mesh with your original point of truth, then you have misunderstood your original point of truth. You see how he's saying? I, I have a six-month-old daughter. She eats milk. A couple of weeks ago, she started other foods. But she, her primary diet is still milk. So when God says, who is he going to teach a mature message to? Is it those who are still on the breast? Is it those who are still eating milk? What is he saying? He's saying that when you approach the scriptures like a baby, you get a baby's message. But the way to avoid that is to be mature, is to look all the way through, to compare one precept to another, to take a little from here and a little from there, and find a message that is consistent from cover to cover. And if we do that, I dare say we'll have a lot fewer kinds of Christian churches out there as we come to a real understanding of Bible truth. So now that we are armed with an understanding of what the Bible is and how to properly study it, we turn back to the question I posed to you earlier. Why don't more Christians study and understand Bible prophecy? If it is indeed the best way to prove that God is real, it stands to reason we should know more about it. Why don't we? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Daniel. A little book of Daniel. It is a few books to the right of Isaiah. You will go through Jeremiah, 
Lamentations, and Ezekiel, and finally the little book of Daniel. And we're going to chapter 12, which is the last chapter of the book. So Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 says this. It's a message from God to Daniel, and it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. And so, aha! That's why nobody studies it. The book is sealed! We're not supposed to study it. It's not meant to be understood. It's in there for some reason, but it's not for us. That's what most of our churches will tell us. Or some variation of that, right? But that's the excuse. You'll point to Daniel 12, verse 4, and say, see, it's a sealed book. Well, I have two responses to that. The first is that while Daniel may indeed be a sealed book, do you think that there's another book somewhere in the Bible that might reveal something to us? How about the revelation? Slide. <laughs> How about the revelation? Right? The book of Revelation has the word reveal right in it. It's right there in the title. And so sure enough, we find that Daniel and Revelation are companion books. They complement and complete one another. They use each other to help unlock their deepest mysteries. And so, my second comeback would be to apply one of these mature Bible techniques, right? And instead of just reading half of Daniel 12, verse 4, let's read the whole verse, amen? Isn't it crazy people read half a verse and decide it's true? Let's read the whole thing. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, in its entirety, says, You, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So indeed, the book was sealed, but not forever. Amen? The Bible says that God, or excuse me, God says that the prophecies of Daniel are not meant to be principally understood until what the Bible calls the time of the end, when many run to and fro and knowledge increases. So to identify when, when this time of the end is, the Bible says, tells us to look for speedy transportation and increased knowledge. Am I making that up? And so I have a few very simple questions for you. Let's go all the way back in time to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. When he wanted to conquer a land or go to war or even get from point A to point B, how fast could he travel? He could travel as fast as his horse could take him. That is right. How about several hundred years after that with Alexander the Great? As he is conquering the known world before the age of 30, how, could, how fast could he do so? As fast as his horse could take him, right? How about Christopher Columbus? As he sails to the Americas and explores a whole new land that they don't even think exists back home, how fast could he do it? Well, yes, well, that's the travel part. But as he's exploring one land, how fast can he go? As fast as his horse can take him. Do you see a pattern? How about the father of this country, George Washington, as he's fighting the Revolutionary War or campaigning to be the first president or doing any of the things he did, how fast could he get around? As fast as his horse could take him. And yet, only about 100 years after George Washington's presidency, we see a major shift. We see suddenly the invention of the internal combustion engine lit, giving rise to the horseless carriage, the horseless buggy, right? The very first cars. And now, of course, today we have something much more uh, fast than this, right? We've got the fastest cars in the world that you go to a lonely stretch of road and race them until the sun comes up for some reason. Uh, it's not really my thing, but some people do this, right? <laughs> So we've got these internal combustion engines. In the 20th century, it gave rise also to the jet engines. We have these jets that can go thousands of miles an hour through the sky, uh, eventually giving rise then to the rocket engine that goes so fast it can break the uh, Earth's gravitational pull. As recently as the 1950s, it would take about six months to travel from the East Coast to the West Coast because even though we had cars, we didn't have roads. We did not have our modern uh, highway system. So in the 1950s, that's true. But in the end of the 1960s, I mean, just 10 or 15 years later, we suddenly, instead of six months from one end of the country to the other, now we can go from the Earth to the moon in three days. How fast does that change? So fast. People are running to and fro. We can't get there fast enough. And what about knowledge? What about the increase of knowledge? Well, we have computer technology and the internet 
that has brought the entire world close together. Christine mentioned I was on this TV network called 3 AM earlier this year. After my interview aired, I got a Facebook message from a dude in Italy who is now my Facebook friend. Right? Some dude I've never met on the other side of the world. He sends me a message at the touch of a button. He says, hey, I like your show. Let's be friends. Right? The whole internet is bringing the world down to this big. Right? It's a small world like it's never been before. We have medical technology keeping people alive longer than they ever thought possible. And not just like on a breathing machine and a tube, but good, healthy lives longer than their parents and their grandparents did. We have, whereas in the 70s, a computer would take up five rooms and have a team of engineers programming it with punch cards, now I venture to say that many of you have a computer in your pocket in the form of your iPhone or other smartphone device. Right? And we see also an increase in archaeological knowledge, digging up the past, even in my lifetime. Archaeology could only confirm the events of the Bible to about the time of King David or King Solomon, around 1000 BC. That is not true anymore. There is archaeological finds out there, documented archaeological finds, that will lend credibility to some of the earliest claims in the Bible. Genesis chapter 15, in the time of Abraham, the earth itself is teaching us. It's opening its secrets to us. We see an increase of knowledge like we've never had before. And so, sure enough, all of these things started to happen in the mid-1800s or so, and if you want to attach a date to it, it would be 1859. That date is the date that crude oil was first refined and manufactured for commercial purposes. So 1859 and thereabouts would be when all of these things began, and sure enough, because God is never wrong, it was the early to mid-1800s when the prophecies of the book of Daniel began to be principally studied and understood by the common man. And although you could find religious leaders studying these things in the 1700s or isolated people all the way back even to the early Christian church, it wasn't until the 1820s, 30s, and 40s where people like you and I opened their Bibles at home and began to read for themselves. So your logical question is, well, if these prophecies can be understood, why doesn't everybody understand them? Good question. And once again, where do we go for Bible answers? The Bible. Uh, Bible, right? So we're going to go down the same book, same chapter, Daniel chapter 12, but we're going to read verses 9 and 10. God repeats himself, as he often does, for emphasis, but he gives additional detail here. The verses 9 and 10, He, the angel of God, said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The Bible itself says not everybody's going to understand the Bible. You have to be wise in the sight of God to get these messages. And I wonder, first of all, how many of us today want to be counted among the wise? That is not every hand in the room. I was hoping for every hand, but that was enough hands. All right? We want to be counted among the wise, and I encourage you because it's not that hard to do so. What is the criteria for God on how we become wise in His sight? You want my opinion? I'll give you a good one. How about we turn to 2 Timothy? We were already there once today. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15, the verse right before the one we read earlier. Paul is writing to Timothy, who was a young guy at the time. And Paul says, And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise. wise. Look at that. Wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Wisdom about God, wisdom from God, is found in the pages of the scriptures, and scriptural wisdom is what you need to penetrate the prophecies of the books of Daniel and Revelation. So, I challenge you today to be honest with yourself. If you are reading through Daniel and or Revelation, and the words simply do not make sense to you, we can't penetrate it, I dare say your knowledge of the Bible is not good enough. And that you need to, I mean, I told you this is going to be tough, right? I'm going to challenge you. Bible prophecy challenges you 
No matter what your background is, I've never met anyone to go from ignorance of prophecy to knowledge of prophecy and not be changed by the, prophet, by the process. So I dare you to be honest with yourselves about how well you really know the Bible. And I encourage you to seek God, find godly instructors, and learn God's wisdom directly from Him through a study of the Scriptures. We find in Psalm 119, which is the biggest book of the Bible, just about right in the middle. Psalm 119 is the biggest chapter of the biggest book. And we're going to read verses 97 and 98. Psalm 119. Verses 97 and 98. The psalmist says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, God, through your commandments, make me wiser. There's that word again. Wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Did you catch that, friends? Something about the commandments of God make you wise. It says it right there, black and white. Now, do we all know what the commandments are? Number one, worship no other God except me. Number two, do not create or worship images of anything in the form of the things in the air or on the earth or under the sea. Number three, do not take the Lord's name in vain. Number four, is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. On it, do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox or oxen, nor your strangers within your gates. In six days you shall do all your work. But rest on the seventh day, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day, therefore he blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That is the fourth commandment. I will tell you there is more controversy in Christianity today about the fourth commandment than probably any other topic except Daniel and Revelation. People will go all up and out of their way to tell you that the commandments of God are nullified or void simply to get around the problem of the fourth commandment. But the Bible continues, because the Bible says an understanding of the commandments makes you wise. So the Bible continues in this vein, in verses 99 and 100 of the same chapter. It says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. You ever come to class and you wish you knew more than the teacher? The Bible just said you can and finally, same chapter, verses 104 and 105, it said, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And over and over again, we find that true godly wisdom comes from the Bible. Not from academics, not from math class, not from books about the Bible, says the guy who wrote a book about the Bible. Not from politics, not from anything on earth but from the Bible and the Bible alone. Indeed, we find in Psalm 111, just a few pages before where you are now, Psalm 111 and verse 10, we find the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all of those who do His commandments. And so once again, in a totally different psalm, we find a link between the commandments of God and wisdom from God. And so with all of that said, with that lengthy introduction, let us turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of Daniel and read a prophecy, shall we? You already know where Daniel is, but let's go back there to Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to tell you the story of a king and how he changed history. Alright, Daniel chapter 2. Historical context. In the year 609 B.C., something big happened. The nation of Babylon is the oldest nation on earth. We find its foundations in Genesis chapter 10. Um, Babylon doesn't exist anymore, but it is contained in the country that we know today as Iraq. So Iraq, Mesopotamia, Babylon is the oldest seat of society on earth. Um, that said, in 609 B.C., something changed. A man named Nebuchadnezzar came to power, and he was not satisfied with the same old, same old Babylon. So he brought the kingdom to a new era of prosperity. He made it rich, he made it grand, he made it wealthy. Um, we see this blue gate right here is the Ishtar Gate. It has been preserved. It is, 
it is on display, actually, I believe at the London Museum, or some other museum, but I'm pretty sure it's the London Museum. And all these little images all over it are the images of the various pagan Babylonian gods. And so as you walked into the city of Babylon, you knew where the city claimed to get its power from, all of these various items. We also, I hope you're familiar with the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which is the next, yeah. It's one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. No longer in existence, but it was one of, one of the seven most awesome things of the ancient world. And it was from Babylon. It was commissioned by Nebuchadnezzar. So Babylon is not only a real place, but it's a, a place with important historical significance. Well, in the year 605 BC, when Neo-Babylon was, was still getting started, Nebuchadnezzar and his armies went and besieged the the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem, which is the nation of the Jews. And they won. As a result of this military victory, they took about one-third of the population of Judah captive. And they brought them back on foot, about a thousand miles, on foot, back to the city of Babylon. Daniel, who is the author of the book of Daniel, and his three friends who are identified as Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or among these people who were taken captive, interestingly, so was the prophet Ezekiel. So Daniel and Ezekiel were contemporaries. They wrote about the same things from the same place. Not to the same people, though, which is why the books are different. Um, and so that is the context that we're going to pick up here. Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to read in, in the first three verses. Now, Daniel is kind of long, so I don't have the scriptures from Daniel 2 up here. You just need to follow your Bibles. So Daniel 2, verses 1 through 3 says, In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So the king stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Do you get it? He's having some bad dreams, he's having trouble sleeping, but one night in particular, he wakes up and he says, wow, that was powerful. I just wish I remember what it was. So he goes to his wise people. The job of the wise men was to consult the various pagan gods and get wisdom that defied human understanding. So was it a reasonable thing from an earthly standpoint for him to say, tell me what I dreamed last night? Can anyone in this room tell me what I dreamed last night? No, but he goes to these people, and that's exactly his demand. So if you were to keep reading the beginning part of this chapter, their response is like, ah, why don't you just tell us what the dream was, and then we'll interpret it for you. Nebuchadnezzar was kind of a crazy man, but he was not a dumb man. And so down in verse 8, the king answered this and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. Uh, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. So these wise men sort of freak out because they realize there is no possible way that they can tell the king what he wants to hear. And he has threatened them with death. Not only them, but their families. So I'm going to kill you and your families, and I'm going to bust down your house like you never existed. And so in verse 11, they have to admit that they're liars and they're being paid for no reason. Verse 11, they say to the king, it is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, and their dwelling is not with flesh. Whereas we don't talk to them. I know you think we do. I know you pay us to do that. But we can't actually do that. And so the king is mad and orders their execution, and the captain of the guard goes around and starts to kill these men. Now, if in chapter 1 of Daniel, Daniel and his friends go through a series of events that kind of propels them to a position of authority within the kingdom. And so they're counted among the wise men. And so a man named Arioch, the, the captain of the guard, shows up at Daniel's house and says, Hey, I'm here to kill you. And Daniel's response is, Why in the world would you do that? Right? So uh, he... Ariok tells him what's going on, and Daniel knew the king, at least somewhat, so he, he asks for the, an audience with the king, and he goes in and says, King, I can tell you what you want to know, but I need time first because I have to talk to God. Give me until the morning, and I will come back and tell you what you need to know. And so the king, anxious to actually have someone give him the answer, says, all right, we have until the morning. Well, verses 17, 18, 19 of Daniel 2 tells us what Daniel did. 
So Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. What is the word we use to describe a vision that you receive at night? A dream. Do we dream when we're awake? Generally speaking, do we dream when we're awake? No. no not in the same way that we do at night time with the various stages of sleep that we anyway. Okay. So the point I want to see to I want you to realize is that some of you might be more pious than I think, but I would dare say just about everybody in this room, if they had a death sentence the following morning, would spend the entire night before awake. Even if you take the pious route of praying, you'd probably spend all night praying, wouldn't you? Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. I have no way to do this unto myself. Please help me, God. Please help me. I trust that you can do what you say you're going to do. But help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Take a break, go to the bathroom, get some food, and then you're back on your knees. Help me, God. I can't do this on myself. Right? That's not what Daniel did. Daniel had a short prayer meeting with his friends, and then he went to sleep. His trust and his faith in the Lord was so strong that he said, there's nothing else I can do, it's up to God. And God answered him in a dream. If Daniel's faith had been weaker, if he had not gone to sleep, God could not have answered in a dream. Daniel would not have gotten the answer, and he and his friends would have been killed the following morning. We would not have the book of Daniel, we would not have the book of Revelation, and the whole Bible would be very different. That's a big consequence, isn't it? simply because he chose to go to sleep. Another point is that the same God who was alive and answered Daniel's prayer back then is still alive today. And he still wants to answer prayers of people who call upon him. So if you have something in your life that is plaguing you, whether it is something as stupid as a bad grade or a bad teacher, or something as significant as maybe a family breaking up or a financial trouble that might you know, change the course of your life, whatever it is is not too big for God. I saw a saying that I really like. It says, do not tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. I encourage you to take this seriously. Just as Daniel brought his biggest problem to the Lord, so can you. And God will answer him. And so, um, he wakes up, he gives praise to God, and the following morning he goes in and talks to the king. And down in verse, I believe it's 28, um, Daniel says to the king, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Isn't that amazing? Now, your skepticism might say, when I pray to God, I never get an answer. My prayers bounce off the ceiling. What is it you're praying about? Maybe you're not praying at all. Maybe you're skeptical. Maybe you don't know anybody who says they've ever gotten anything from God. Why should you try? You know, the Bible says in the book of James, don't turn there because I want you to stay in Daniel, but the book of James, chapter 4, verse 2, gives us this instruction. It says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. God is a gentleman. He does not force himself on anybody. Right? So he says, you don't have anything for me because you have not asked anything from me. Why don't we take God at his word and start asking him for stuff? I do not want to get to heaven and find out that God has all of these blessings ready for me, but I never asked for any of them. Let me tell you, I ask for stuff. I hope you do too. So verse 28, God says, or excuse me, Daniel says to the king, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So automatically, the contents of this prophecy have to do with the latter days, the future tense from Daniel's perspective. And the Bible uses that term latter days to mean the end of time. So this prophecy is going to stretch all the way until what we would understand as the end of human history. <laughs> your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. And then Daniel begins to expound upon this dream. And so we read the substance of this dream, right, starting in verse 31. Let us just read the whole thing. Daniel says, You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. The 
This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms were of silver. I think we've got a picture. Yeah. Its chest and its arms were of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while the stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That is the substance of the dream. Daniel goes on to then interpret the dream for the king. Before we go to the interpretation, however, I want to show you how beautifully the Bible parallels itself. So bookmark here and go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is one book before Daniel. Remember, they are contemporaries. We find in Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 25 through 27, something I find very amazing. Now again, the nation of the Jews had fallen into horrible apostasy. They had rebelled against God for like 800 years. And so finally God said, enough. I'm done with you people. I gave you eight centuries to repent. Right? Now you have to deal with Babylon. And so he sends Babylon to them to essentially teach them a lesson, right? That God has a line past which he will not permit humanity to cross. But he gives them this prophecy. Starting in verse 25, it says, Now to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, take off the crown, nothing shall remain the same, exalt the humble, and humble the exalted. Let's stop there. When Babylon took over, there were no more kings in Judah. Up to that point, there had been several hundred years, one king after another, but after Babylon took over, there was never a king again for the Jews, ever. So God says in verse 27, Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes whose right it is. Sorry. I may or may not have, there it is. So let's go to the next one. So according to this prophecy in Ezekiel, here we are in Babylon, he says... What's the wording here? He says, no, 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 go back. He says, overthrown, 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 and then he will come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Who is the true and only king of Israel? Jesus Christ. And so, according to Ezekiel, somewhere down in here is when we should find Jesus. So let's go back to Daniel 2 and read the interpretation of the dream. Starting in verse 37. Daniel says, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar, by extension Babylon, represents the head of gold. We know that it's not just a man, but rather his whole kingdom, because of how the prophecy continues. In the next verse, 39, he says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, uh, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all of the others. So, from, I, I didn't make any of that up, right? From the pages of the Bible, we are led to understand that each one of these metals represents a successive kingdom on the earth. Starting with Babylon, we go then to whoever conquered Babylon. And so Babylon ruled the earth from 605 B.C., shortly after it came into this new Babylon, Neo-Babylon time, um, 605 B.C. until 539 B.C. when it was conquered by the group you find in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, this was the dual kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Persia is what we would know in modern day Iran. Medo-Persia ruled the earth from 539 
until 331. Every detail of the statue is important. It is silver instead of gold. They were not as rich as Babylon or as powerful. And because it was a dual kingdom, the Medes and the Persians were not the same people. They kind of teamed up to make an empire. We see the duality of it represented by two arms. Every detail is important. But they only ruled until 331 BC. Who took over after who conquered Medo Persia? Anybody see the movie 300? Really? None of you? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Who were the two powers that battled in that movie? The Spartans, who were part of what nation? Greece. And whom? The Persians! Right! And so this is, even though it's a fictional movie, it's based on actual history, right? And so after, you know, Persia comes to the Kingdom of Greece, represented by bronze. Did you know the encyclopedias will tell you that the era of uh, the Greek Empire was the Bronze Age of history? It's almost like God knows everything, doesn't it? Uh, Greece ruled from 331 until 168. That's, that's not as dogmatic a date as the other ones because Greece kind of fell apart and got conquered in pieces. But 168 BC is when the final piece of it got conquered. Um, before we go on any further, the prophecies in the book of Daniel all parallel each other. They cover the same material every time. But God elaborates and gives additional detail with every one. And so when we go to Daniel chapter 8 and read the, pre the prophecy there, we see in Daniel 8 verses 20 and 21 that God actually identifies the two kingdoms that follow Babylon as Medo-Persia and Greece by name. It's right there in the Bible. The Bible's best interpreter is the Bible. That is how we will avoid a thousand different contradictory interpretations if we just let the Bible interpret in itself. So who took over Greek or Greece? There's none other than the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Rome ruled from 168 BC until the mid fourth century AD. Again, that's not a dogmatic date because the the last emperor abdicated, and then sometime later the Senate voted himself out of existence, and then there was a Greek war and whatnot. But the mid fourth century AD is a, is a good period of time. The last emperor came out of power in 478 AD. But that's not the end, is it? After the legs of iron come the feet of iron and clay. And you'll notice there is still iron. So unlike all the other ones, the metal ceases. It's not the case here. Metal remains. But now something else is introduced into it. Who conquered Rome? Nobody conquered Rome. Rome was not conquered. Rome fell apart. And what happened, again, it happened in pieces, but essentially Rome got too big for itself. There were too many different groups of people vying for power and riches, and the government just became completely ineffective. Find anyone on C-SPAN? And so um, what happened is Rome simply stopped existing. It fell apart, and these various groups of people who made up the Roman I don't know, government of the Roman population dispersed from Rome into the various parts of Europe. And so here's a list of the ten dominant tribes that came out of Rome. The Alamanni, the Burgundians, the Franks, the Lombards, the Saxons, the Suevi, the Visigoths, and then the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths who are no longer with us. They are wiped out by the power identified in Daniel chapter 7. Each of these grew up, they settled and grew up to become the nations that we know as our modern European nations. The Franks, right, this is the easiest thing. The Franks go to France. That's like, you know, that just makes perfect sense. But also the Saxons go to England, they team up with the Anglos, and this is from which we get the name England, because it's Anglo land, right? So this is where Europe came from. It came directly from the dissolution of the Roman Empire, and how many are there? Ten. How many toes are there in two feet? Ten. Coincidence? No. no. Nothing is a coincidence with God. Um, what about the clay? Is that the next one? Are we on the clay? Yeah, okay. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6, the clay must mean something, right? What does the Bible say the clay is represented above? In Jeremiah 18 and verse 6, it said, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, 
so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What is clay representative of? People. What kind of people? God's people. Was there an influx of religion into Europe after the fall of Rome? There was, right? And not only Europe, like, or not only religion like churches, like we have churches in America today, but the statue was all representative of kingdoms, right? And there's the clay mixed right in there with the iron. And so we should see a secular religion, a religion that takes the power of government. Did we see that? How was your, how, how was your European history? You know that the Catholic, what we would understand as the Catholic Church ruled Europe for over a thousand years? There are stories, hmm, story of King Somebody from Europe, the details escape here, King Somebody from uh, England standing outside in the snow for three days waiting for an audience with the Pope to get permission to take his seat of power. Right? This is a religion acting as the government. And we see it right there in the statue. We see, uh, let's go back to Daniel 2 and continue to read, because what does the Bible say about these feet? Verse 41, Daniel chapter 2. The Bible says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, not conquered. Notice. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Mingle with the seed of men. So if we go to Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark, we can see this huge tapestry on the inside that shows the various royal families of Europe and their attempts to intermarry their nations together. Did any of that ever work? We got two world wars to prove that ever worked, right? Napoleon, General Napoleon tried to do it, and he failed. Adolf Hitler tried to do it, and he failed. History shows all a whole bunch of people, this like this circus of characters trying to unite Europe, all of whom fail because the Bible says they will not adhere one to another any more than iron mixes with clay. In our modern day, we're trying to do it with money, and yet you'll see this is dated September 28th of this year. European Union in crisis, will it survive? For the first time, the idea that the global finances are so bad that it will actually destroy the European Union has become a talking point. Financial experts predict the euro will be extinct within a year. There are others who are more hopeful, and they say that somehow we're going to pull it all together. But the word of God says no. Nothing that we do will ever unite Europe, because they shall not adhere one to another any more than iron mixes with clay. You watch over the next year or two, I don't know the exact time frame, but you watch. And when the European Union dissolves, you can say, I already knew that. Daniel chapter 2. All right. So, how does this prophecy end? Who remembers? After the feet of iron clay, what happens? There's a rock cut out without hands. It comes from the sky, strikes the feet of the statue, destroys the statue, and then it all blows away. And the rock becomes as big as the whole earth. What is this rock? How do we find out how to interpret Bible prophecy? From the Bible. And so we'll turn to the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, chapter 32 and verse 4. And we will find this written by Moses. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright. Is he? We will find a similar uh, sentiment in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Samuel, chapter 2, and verse 2. 
The Bible says, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. We'll turn to Psalm chapter 28, Psalm 28 and verse 1. We'll find it again. Psalm 28 and verse 1. Psalm 28, verse 1, the Bible says, To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. So God is the rock, but God is a big God, amen? Can we be more specific? How about in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 42 and 44, you will see that Jesus of Nazareth claims this description for himself. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 verses 42 and 44. He says, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's saying that about himself. Verse 44, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You see how he's using imagery from Daniel 2? It says, if you fall on me, you'll be broken. And that's the kind of broken we want to be. But if we wait too long and Jesus has to fall on us, we'll be crushed to pieces and blown away like the statue. Let us accept Jesus before it's too late. Amen? And of course, just in case we want to be even more specific, we can go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, and verse 4. 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, and verse 4, which says, All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Can the Bible possibly get any clearer? And so we have Jesus coming after the time of the divided Europe, according to the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2. We have the return of Jesus Christ in the next slide, represented by this rock. Jesus coming with the host of the angels to put an end to this horrible world where people die, where people get sick, where people get stuck in traffic, foreclosed upon where their voices are unheard, where they're persecuted. All of these horrors are not permanent. Amen. And here comes Jesus to bring us to a land of no death. Amen. So to review, the statue of Daniel 2. We have Babylon as the head of gold, Medo Persia as the chest and arms of silver, Greece as the thighs of bronze, Rome as the legs of iron, a divided Europe represented by the feet of iron, and clay, and then the return of Jesus Christ following that. The speed of iron and clay. Have you noticed the world is a little crazy? What's a little crazy? We've got nuclear bombs. Did you know just like one or two days ago, Russia went on record, I pay attention to international news and politics, Russia went on record and said, you know, the NATO... Uh, line of defense is coming closer to our borders. Now America is um, building a, a military force in Australia to counter the growing military force of China. We feel that the chance of all-out nuclear war is higher now than it's been in a generation. Two days ago, they said that. The world is sick. The world is in trouble. The world is dying. The world is dying of a disease the Bible calls sin. Praise the Lord, here comes Jesus to put an end to that. Everyone who wants to go home to the land of no death has a free pass. Because salvation is a free gift. Jesus did all of the work on the cross and there's nothing else you can do to earn heaven. Amen. The world today is filled with a never-ending series of news about war. Or, yeah, the, right. And so the news about the sense of time that are running out is about war. It's about disaster. Move ahead here. War. Disaster. Um, the fledgling economy, the failing economy everywhere. 
But these are not the signs. They are signs. Jesus says these things will happen, but they, he says these things must happen, but the end is not yet. What does Jesus says is the very last thing that has to happen before he can return? The gospel. Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Let me tell you tonight, friends, this is happening. We saw, when I was in grade school, we saw the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And suddenly the Iron Curtain was destroyed. And for the first time in several generations, we see Russia reborn. We're opening the borders to these things. And as a result of this, uh, any of you who are familiar with 3ABN has a sister network, 3ABN Russia. Yeah, so they have a huge production facility in Russia, in the heart of communism, sending out messages by satellite and internet about the soon return of Jesus Christ. We see, um, we see, we have seen baptisms numbering in the thousands at a time. Can you imagine so many people giving their lives to the Lord? You need a swimming pool to hold them, or even better, a whole river to hold them. And this is happening all around the world. It's happening in the Middle East today. Amen in the most Islamic parts of the world where it seems like the light of God or the light of Christianity is flickering or going out. No, that's not the truth. The truth behind the scenes is that people are coming to God every day. I have seen, I've met these people. I've read their testimonies. It is happening today. And God says, that is the last thing that needs to happen before I come. Is prophecy powerful? Do you find it interesting that we have a prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ written down 600 years before the first coming of Jesus Christ? I find that quite interesting. Today, friends, I want to make an appeal to you. Because I don't believe that this is what I'm saying. I don't believe the world's message that everybody is all the same and everybody is equally true and everybody can get to heaven any way they want. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. And it's not about what church you attend, or how good you are, or how much money you give, or any of those stupid things that we as humans make religion. It's about wanting to be in a land with no death. To live in a land the way God made it in the first place. Eden and restored. No more disease. No more death. No more being away from loved ones. No more pop quizzes. No more English papers. No more traffic. No more cat litter. No more inoculation. As a father of a six month old, the worst three days of my life were bringing my child to the doctor, watching strangers stick needles in her legs. I'm looking forward to a day when that is not true. Ago, I got a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. I'm looking forward to a day when my brain doesn't self-destruct anymore. When I don't have to go through daily or weekly treatments. When I don't have a neurologist to live with any call. I'm looking forward to a day when I can see my family at least once a week for worship, no matter where they choose to live in the universe. Instead of having to say goodbye to my family coast and see them only once, maybe twice a year. I'm looking forward to that day, and I'm inviting you to look forward to that day, too. And I'm not inviting you to join my church. You've probably never seen me again in your lives. But I am inviting you to make a decision tonight. And I printed up some cards for you that are really for you, not for me. They will be collected at the end, but they're not really for cataloging purposes or anything like that be clear about what it is I'm asking you to decide tonight. You don't need to share your answers with me or with anybody else. Someone's going to pass out those cards and have something to write with. And then I'm going to review it with you just so you know what it is I'm calling to today. You don't need to guess. We don't guess about prophecy, right? So why should we guess about this? But I want to tell you a story while this is happening. It's my story. I was raised in Christian churches. I 
was a member of the Catholic Church and the Presbyterian Church before I went to college. When I went to college in New York City, I got very intoxicated with the world, and sometimes intoxicated in a physical sense. And I lost sight of God. Until one morning, two very large buildings almost fell on my head. I was living about 400 feet away from the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. And on that morning, I prayed my last prayer twice. And as I walked as part of the mass evacuation in the 82 degree heat, in a community that if you've lived in California your whole life, you don't even understand. And these, this ash rained down on us. Ash consisting of parts of the destroyed building, but unfortunately parts of the people inside that destroyed building. I didn't know what was right anymore. And I lost about 14 months of my life drinking, not sleeping, feeling sorry for myself. But God changed all of that. He showed me that the things that happen in this world are not random, they're not coincidence, and they're not outside of His control. And I praise the Lord for September 11th, not because of the tragedy because it showed me that there was something bigger than myself. And it made me take God seriously for the first time in my whole life. In my whole life. I'm inviting you today to do the same. Because whatever problems plague you, and let's be real, everybody's got problems, right? By the time I was your age, I had already done my very hardest to destroy my life. And so even though you people are young, I do not put it past you to have something equally as horrible in your past as I did. But the best part about the good news of Jesus Christ is that He knew every stupid thing that you would ever do 2,000 years before you were born. And He decided that you were worth saving anyway. And as He went to that cross, broken, bloody, and bruised, He allowed them to drive the nails through His hands and His feet. He allowed his life to be poured out into death. With only one thought in mind. And you. I invite you tonight to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You won't be sorry. Faith 
And we ask that by your grace we might be ready to look you in the eye when you come and not be ashamed. As everybody here desires to hear those words from your mouth, well done, my good and faithful servant. We ask for your grace to strengthen us so that we might indeed live a life that is worthy of being called well done. Be with us even as we depart from this place. Minister to our hearts and our minds with the Holy Spirit that we might not forget the things we've learned here tonight. And let this indeed be the first day of the rest of our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, friends. One final closing thought as you go on your way. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 says, The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, Jesus testifies of himself through Bible prophecy. If prophecy becomes difficult or discouraging, remember... Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. And he will bring you where you need to have the resources you need to understand his testimony. And I promise, if you study the prophecies, you will know Jesus better than you ever thought possible. Thank you. Good night.